Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello and welcome to SCOTUS Cast. I'm your host, Justin Drewer, on behalf of the Faculty Division of the Federalist Society. We're here today to discuss United States v. Texas, which was argued before the court on November 29th. It's my honor to introduce Professor Ilya Soman, who is a professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. His research focuses on constitutional law, property law, democratic theory, federalism, and migration rights. Uh, so to start off our, our talk today, um, why don't you give us some background on the case, um, you know, how we got to this point and, and why people should, should care about this case broadly. Sure. Uh, so uh, in the United States, we have something like 11 million undocumented immigrants, possibly more. Uh, no administration, not even the Trump administration, which was the most anti-immigration administration many decades, no administration can possibly hope to deport and, or, or detain all of them. So administrations historically have tried to prioritize some categories of deportable aliens uh, over others. Uh, and uh, the Biden administration uh, recently issued a set of guidelines where they would prioritize for detention and removal, three categories of people. One is uh, those guilty of potentially suspected of terrorism. Second, those convicted of serious crimes. And third, people caught at the border, as opposed to people who had been caught in the interior uh, of the United States. Uh, these are sort of narrower set of priorities that are the Trump administration, uh, which was much less willing to say we're focusing on some groups of people to the exclusion of others. Uh, and uh, this has been challenged in court by the states of Texas and Louisiana, which argued that the Biden administration's guidelines are illegal under two statutes known as 8 U.S.C. Section 1226 and Section 1231, uh, which essentially says that the federal government, quote, shall detain aliens convicted of certain types of crimes uh, and those that are under an order of removal. And their base card was like, it's mandatory uh, that the federal government detain these people, and therefore they can't set priorities under which many of them uh, might not be detained. Uh, a lower court judge, uh, district court judge in Texas, uh, issued not an injunction, uh, but a vacature order blocking the uh, uh, the implementation of the policy, and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit refused to overturn that, though they didn't actually issue an opinion. They just uh, refused the uh, federal government's motion to lift this, whereupon the Supreme Court uh, chose to hear the case on a, uh, a somewhat expedited basis without having the Fifth Circuit uh, you know, reach a final decision on uh, any of the issues in it. Uh, I think there are at least two big issues in the case, possibly three. Uh, the first big issue uh, is whether Texas and Louisiana or any state even have standing to bring this case. Uh, they argue that their standing arises from the fact that uh, if there are more undocumented immigrants who are not detained or removed by the federal government, that that might impose some costs on the state government. For example, some of them might spend more time in state prison facilities, or they might use state government services or the like. And they say, relying in part on previous precedent, that if Texas or another state suffers even one dollar of extra costs as a result of this sort of thing, then that's enough to get standing. And there is indeed some Supreme Court precedent which says that one dollar of economic damages uh, is enough to get standing. Uh, the second issue is actually obviously the substantive issue at stake in the case, which is can the executive actually set these sorts of enforcement priorities, or does shall mean shall, and they have to detain all of these people, even though, as was discussed in the oral argument, 
it probably actually is impossible uh, to detain all of them given current resources or indeed any imaginable resources that any Congress is ever likely to grant the uh, federal government executive short of simply you know, making immigration enforcement like the sole function of the federal government and turning the entire federal budget uh, over to this particular uh, purpose. Uh, so there is that issue. Uh, and finally, uh, there is the question of whether a district court has the power to impose the remedy of vacature. And this has a sort of two dimensions. There's a narrow dimension, uh, which is whether this remedy violates 8 U.S.C. Section 1252, which is a specific immigration statute says that no court other than the Supreme Court shall have the authority to enjoin or restrain the operation of certain provisions of immigration law or certain measures taken under them, including 1226 and 1231. So uh, the Supreme Court granted cert uh, in part on the question of simply of, you know, does section 1252 bar vacature as well as barring uh, the issuance of an injunction, uh, which uh, is a more traditional kind of remedy, but technically vacature, unlike an injunction, does not issue a specific order to the defendant saying that they must do something or not do something. What vacature does is it says the particular government policy in question, in this case, the uh, guidelines on enforcement priorities that uh, that uh, government policy uh, has no legal standing and has no force. So in principle, it can have an effect very similar to an injunction, but uh, legally speaking, it's distinct. Uh, so one question is whether the wording of Section 1252 uh, bars the use of vacature as well as the use of injunctions. The other broader question, which has been raised in briefs before the court and also by some prominent legal scholars, uh, is whether the remedy of vacature is itself actually permissible under the Administrative Procedure Act. It has been used many times, particularly by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, but these scholars and also now the Biden administration in a somewhat ironic moves, it's mostly conservative legal scholars that have made this argument, but the Biden people have been happy to take it up. Uh, you know, they now say that the remedy of vacature just simply is a fault, is a bogus remedy that courts just made up because they weren't paying attention to what the Administrative Procedure Act really said or to its original meaning uh, and, and so on. So those are the three issues. Uh, if you want, I can now go into, you know, what I think should be done on these issues or, uh, you know, how they, they went in oral argument. It's up to you, you know, how we should proceed. Um, I think a, a combo of the two would be great. You know, maybe you talk about any highlights from oral argument that you think are worth highlighting, any, you know, surprising things that came up, but also please feel free to uh, to insert your, your own okay. opinions. So there. why don't, I briefly go over what I think of the issues, and then I can go over what happened in the oral argument, or we can do it in a reverse order, whichever you prefer. Uh, let's do your opinions first, and then and then okay. proceed. Yeah. So let me briefly go over what I think should be done in about these three issues, uh, and I should emphasize that that doesn't mean that that's what the court will actually do. Uh, but although in some cases, I think there's a decent chance that it will. Let's talk first about standing. Uh, I think there's an interesting trade-off here in that if you accept Texas's theory of standing, then I think it's probably correct, as some of the liberal Supreme Court justices point out in the questioning, that almost any immigration policy can potentially be challenged because almost any such policy, whether letting in more immigrants or letting in fewer uh, or you know, changing enforcement priorities or whatnot, uh, might have at least some effect on state finances. Uh, but I think that's a bullet that should be bitten uh, because the alternative uh, is that uh, if you rule that these kind of indirect effects uh, are, are not enough for state standing and probably not enough for private standing either, then almost all immigration policies and many other federal policies as well would be immune to challenge because then nobody could claim in most cases that they have uh, you know, the right kind of injury for standing. 
And I think in an age of severe executive overreach uh, and lots of gridlocking Congress and other problems, uh, I think we can't count on the political process alone to police the executive on these matters. Uh, liberals who might like those kind of constraints when Biden is in power, they certainly would not be happy about it the next time there's a Republican president and he does something like Trump's travel ban or many other aggressive and legally dubious Trump actions uh, in the immigration field or certainly in other kinds of fields that also would be affected by this. Uh, I would add also that these kinds of limitations on standing, they have no basis in the text or the original meaning of the Constitution. It's all a body of doctrine essentially made up and developed by the Supreme Court over time. Maybe it serves sort of institutional purposes. You can argue it reduces the amount of litigation or it keeps low quality litigants out of federal court or the like, but states in general are not low quality litigants, at least not in a sense of having bad lawyers or insufficient resources. It is true, and I grant this, that one of the concerns here is we have on both Democrats and Republicans, we have lots of ambitious and very partisan state attorneys generals who love to get their names in the paper by bringing litigation that appeals to their party's base. But I think that's a risk that we should be willing to accept. And if they bring lawsuits that have no merit, then courts can uh, reject them on the merits. If the problem is as some people claim happened in this case, that you can engage in forum shopping and find like the one sympathetic judge that will support your position on this, then the proper approach to that is to limit forum shopping and in particular to deal with these situations that exist in Texas where sometimes there's only one district judge in a particular area. And if that one judge happened to be a very committed conservative or a very committed liberal, you can know in advance that like you're likely to win with this person, even if you wouldn't win with most other judges. I think uh, the way to deal with that is narrowly targeted reforms rather than sort of keeping the states out of court generally. Uh, and I do think uh, if we're not going to reform standing doctrine in general, then you know, if, if we're going to keep the requirement of some sort of material injury, then yes, I, I think $1 should be enough. It's a little bit silly, but the entire doctrine of standing uh, is kind of silly. It's all, it's not just nonsense upon stilts, it's multiple levels of nonsense on top of other nonsense. So what we need to do is sort of minimize the harm that this nonsense causes to enforcement of legal limits on government power. Uh, I'll next talk about the substance and here, uh, the merits that is, uh, and here, uh, while I sympathize with Texas on the standing question, on the merits, I have a very different view. Texas, if you look at their briefs, they concede uh, that federal law enforcement officials should be able to engage in uh, what they call case-by-case -case discretion. That is low-level uh, executive officials should be able to say, well, this undocumented immigrant, he or she doesn't pose that much, but there is not much of a problem, so we'll pass her by and you know, go get somebody else instead. But then they say, well, the Secretary of Homeland Security or the president cannot engage in systematic uh, discretion. I think this doesn't make any sense. It seems like the higher level officials should actually have at least as much or more discretion as the lower level ones. And this is particularly true if you're a conservative enthusiast for unitary executive theory and you believe that ultimately uh, the uh, president uh, should wield all the discretion that's available to the executive branch. Now, I have some reservations about unitary executive theory. I think there may be situations where Congress can legitimately say, we lodge this discretion by law in the hands of some other official or in the hands of a partly independent body like the Federal Reserve Board. But in this case, they did not do that. They did not pass a law saying lower level DHS officials are the sole people who have discretion here. So even if you believe it might have been legally permissible, constitutionally permissible for Congress to do that, they did not do it. And so long as they haven't done it, it seems to me that the president or the secretary of Homeland Security should be able to exercise at least as much discretion as lower level officials. You can say, at whatever level it's systematic is different from case by case, but unless case by case discretion is going to be completely arbitrary, like you're going to flip dice or something like that or flip coins, 
uh, that it has to be guided by some general rules or principles, like how important it is to prioritize a particular person or group, what is the impact, the severity of their offenses, whatever you think is the relevant criterion. And if a low level official can apply those kinds of criteria, I don't see why a higher level official should somehow be forbidden uh, from doing it. On this, I would add the point discussed at length in the oral argument that uh, there is nowhere near the resources to actually enforce all of these laws against more than a small fraction of the relevant population of undocumented immigrants. So there's going to be a lot of discretion regardless of what is done. And it seems reasonable that uh, higher level officials should get to exercise uh, systematic discretion. And there's certainly nothing in the Constitution uh, that prevents it. And similarly, with the word shell, the word shell cannot mean an absolute obligation in a situation where it's impossible to actually meet it in more than a small fraction uh, of the cases. Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kavanaugh, and others brought up this point uh, in the uh, oral argument. Finally, on the issue of vacature, uh, I think this is a complex question, and I don't have uh, nearly as much background and expertise in this as in the other two issues. Uh, I personally would be reluctant to adopt sort of the radical revisionist position of saying this remedy just doesn't exist at all. Maybe it was improperly created by the lower courts decades ago, but it seemed to me statutory stare decisis. Uh, should apply here, uh, that it's, it should be hard to, it's hard to overturn statutory stare decisis than uh, the, you know, than stare decisis uh, in, un, uh, under the constitution, because that's something Congress can more easily change. Moreover, if you look at section 706, it does say the courts have the power to quote, set aside uh, government uh, orders or policies, which uh, violate uh, certain criteria. And to my mind, it's at least reasonably plausible and indeed likely that set aside means the thing is void. There are other possible meanings of set aside, which are discussed in the briefs and the oral arguments, but that one seemed to me the most intuitive, the most plausible. So the existing remedy does seem to me in accordance with the text, but I admit there are people with much deeper expertise on these matters than I have. And some of them you know, reasonably think, you know, this remedy was made up and doesn't actually exist. And I can't completely dismiss that viewpoint. Uh, on the narrower issue of whether it's covered by Section 1252, this too is a, is a tough question in that um, the, the, the statute doesn't actually specifically mention the remedy of, of vacature. It just says uh, that courts can't, quote, enjoin or restrain uh, these sorts of uh, decisions. Uh, by the executive and enjoin or restrain are usually words that are referenced different types of injunctions, though restrain could have a broader application than that. Uh, but, you know, it's not uh, super clear. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, you can make a plausible argument uh, either way on that. And I think I'll probably leave it there. Uh, I will lastly mention that a decision in favor of the administration here would be consistent with the Supreme Court's recent decision in the Remain in Mexico case, uh, which was Biden versus Texas, opposed to this being United States versus Texas. Uh, and there, five justices said that the administration could exercise discretion to terminate the Remain in Mexico program adopted by the Trump administration, despite similar shall wording in some of the uh, relevant statutes. Uh, and uh, there are also similar issues of resource constraints there as there are here. And while it was 5-4 formally, really it was 6-3 on the merits because Justice Barrett dissented only on a procedural ground related, yes, to Section 1252 and uh, you know the, the issue of remedies. Uh, so uh, it seems to me uh, you know, that you can reach a similar decision on the merits here and perhaps avoid the question of vacature. Uh, it doesn't have to be resolved if the uh, if if the uh, federal government wins on the merits, assuming that the states have standing, if the states have standing, do not have standing, uh, then that's a jurisdictional bar, uh, and the court would not be allowed to consider, uh, you know, the the merits issues at that point. But I think if they decide that uh, that uh, the federal government should win on the merits, then they can avoid the issue of whether the remedy imposed by the court was appropriate or not, because there's no need for a remedy if what is being done was actually legal. Uh, I'll say now a few words about what happened in the oral argument. 
Uh, there was a great deal of discussion of the issue of standing. Uh, and I think, interestingly, the liberal justices, some of them do seem inclined to say that Texas has no standing uh, on the theory uh, that uh, on, 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 on the theory that uh, otherwise, you, know, you could challenge almost any immigration policy, and also on the theory that you know this effect is you know is is somewhat indirect. Some of them also raised the issue that maybe on net Texas actually benefits more than it loses from the presence of the undocumented immigrants. They contribute to uh, to state and federal coffers. They contribute to the economy. So even if there are some costs, there may be more benefits. Uh, I'm sympathetic to this as a moral or policy matter. I'm very pro immigration in my writings, uh, but I think to say that you can lose standing because you benefit from a policy in the long run would be a significant innovation and standing doctrine would be problematic in a lot of other areas. There also are some issues here, ironically, that historically liberals actually favored broader theories of standing, whereas conservatives seem to be the opposite, obviously, in this case, as in a number of other current and recent cases, those sides have sort of flipped. And now it seems like people favor broader, narrow standing, depending on whose Oxford is being gored. For the record, I have always favored broad theories of standing for many years, and I still hold uh, that view. I don't think there are five votes for the proposition to Texas has no standing, but I could be wrong about that because there's a couple of the conservative justices where it's not that easy to tell uh, where they stand. On the merits, I think there's at least five votes uh, for the federal government's position. Uh, the three liberal justices clearly seem inclined in that direction. Roberts and Kavanaugh, uh, I think, uh, as well. Uh, and the, both of them emphasize this issue of the impossibility of uh, actually detaining more than a small fraction of the people covered by these policies and therefore the inevitability of discretion. Uh, and uh, it's possible even that there might be one or two more conservative justices who would be in that camp. Uh, whereas by contrast, Justice Alito, I think is clearly in the, the other camp that he thinks that, uh, you know, the Texas should win on the merits. But I think there's at least five votes for, if they do reach the merits, there's at least five votes for the proposition. Uh, that uh, uh, that uh, you know that the federal government should win. Finally, on the question of vacatur, there was a considerable debate among the justices about whether uh, vacatur is just an improper remedy in general. Uh, interestingly, those of the justices who previously sat on the D.C. Circuit, uh, like Roberts, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, uh, and a number of others. They seem very skeptical of the idea that this remedy that the DC Circuit has used for for many years is actually improper or was made up by the circuit judges or whatnot. On the other hand, some of the non DC Circuit judges, the non former DC Circuit justices, I should mention, I should say, like Gorsuch, for example, uh, are more willing to contemplate the idea that the DC Circuit was just badly wrong over the course of many years. I suspect, I think that there are not five votes for the proposition uh, that uh, the remedy of vacatur is, is generally illegitimate. I think there may be, though I'm very uncertain about this, there may be five votes for the proposition that section 1252 bars the remedy of vacatur for this particular set of policies. Uh, I'm also not sure if the court will even reach this issue. They obviously won't if there's no standing. If the, uh, they decide on the merits in favor of an administration, uh, you can try to make an argument as Justice Barrett did uh, in the uh, U.S., I'm sorry, in the Biden versus Texas case on Remain in Mexico. She made the argument that the inability to impose a remedy is itself a jurisdictional bar, so it has to be addressed first. But she did not have five votes for that proposition in that case. Uh, I suspect she also would not have five votes for it here, uh, but I, I don't know for sure. And as I said before, this whole issue of vacatur and remedies is one that I know less about. Uh, finally, I would say sort of a general uh, overview of th this case. The issue of immigration enforcement priorities is very significant on the ground, obviously for the immigrants themselves, but also for uh, their American relatives and associates, businesses that rely on them, communities that are affected by them in various ways. So who is 
on the federal government's radar screen for deportation and who isn't, this affects the lives and livelihood of millions of people. Uh, I think there's also a broader issue that is disturbing that even though I'm sympathetic to the Biden administration's use of discretion in this case, I do admit there is this broader problem that exists in our legal system of we have way more federal law uh, than, can be imp uh, uh, than can be enforced against even more than a small fraction of violators. Uh, in lots of areas of law, and therefore that creates enormous discretion in the executive. I've written before that even if this is constitutionally permissible, it is a serious menace to rule of law in that uh, instead of having a situation where there's a class of lawbreakers, where at least you know, some high percentage of at least can be caught and dealt with, and uh, whether you're targeted depends on your conduct rather than on who happens to be in power. We instead of a situation where not just undocumented immigrants, but even most U.S. citizens are guilty of violating federal law at one point or another, and whether they, the feds go after us depends on whether, to a large extent, depends on whether we meet the enforcement priorities of the particular people who happen to be in power. I find that disturbing both because it's at odds with principles of the rule of law and also because uh, many of the politicians who wield this kind of discretion in both parties, they're not people who I think you know, are wonderfully worthy and trustworthy of this kind of enormous power. But, uh, you know, most other people sort of ignore this issue. They don't seem to care that much, or they only care when it's the opposing party that's in power uh, as opposed to their own. I think in the long run, the only real remedy for this is to reduce the scope of federal law so that we don't have this huge disjunction between the number of lawbreakers and the resource available to catch them. And in the area of immigration law, the only real way to solve this problem is to make legal immigration easier. Uh, if we make it easier, there would be many fewer illegal migrants, and therefore, you know, we would not have you know, this vast population of people living on the, the fringes of the law and their fate is dependent on uh, the enforcement priorities of uh, whoever is in the White House. So this case does raise big general issues about standing, about executive discretion, possibly also about the remedy of vacature, though I think more likely than not, the court will not make a general ruling on whether vacature is acceptable or not. So it has big implications uh, and deserves your consideration, uh, even if you don't agree with you know, with my particular takes on the case. All right, thank you for that very thorough coverage of the case. I know we already uh, kind of touched on your your uh, prediction of the outcome. So, do you have any final thoughts before we yeah. wrap up the episode? So I think the uh, very likely the federal government is going to win and Texas is going to lose. The big question is sort of how is Texas going to lose? Is it going to lose based on standing? Uh, is it going to lose based on the merits or is it going to lose based on the idea that sort of the remedy of vacature either is generally illegitimate or is not available in this particular case because of Section 1252, even if it might be legitimate elsewhere? If I had to guess, and I'm very, very uncertain about this guess, uh, I think probably there will not be five votes for the proposition that Texas has no standing. Therefore, the court will reach the merits and there will be a majority with the three liberal justices plus at least two conservative justices, maybe more, uh, to say that uh, this kind of discretion is available to uh, the administration, possibly because of the inherent resource constraints where uh, there's not possible for them to target more than a small proportion of the undocumented immigrant population. Uh, if that happens, the court may be able to just avoid the issue of remedies, but it's also possible uh, that there could be five votes for the proposition that this remedy is not available under Section 1252. It's even possible that they could rule both that Texas loses on the merits, but also that there's a lack of an available remedy. I'm not sure that deciding one issue necessarily precludes the other. I'm a little uncertain in my own mind as to whether it does or not. Um, and uh, so I think there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly how and why Texas is going to lose and how Texas loses does matter because the different possible ways of losing have different implications for other cases. If they lose based on standing, it will be a significant blow to state standing in future cases, not just future immigration cases, but possibly other cases as well. If they lose based on 
uh, the idea that the venerability of Bay Cage Hur is generally uh, illegitimate, that will have important implications for all sorts of issues beyond immigration. Uh, if they, by contrast, if they lose just on Section 1252, that will have little or no implication beyond the immigration field. So I think it is very likely that Texas will lose again, uh, like they did in Biden v. Texas, but it's hard for me to say exactly how they're going to lose. All right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Soman, and uh, we look forward to uh, to many more future episodes, hopefully. <laughs> I, 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 I hope so as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 